about that greenhouse? Yeah, but the greenhouse. I'm just going to say one word about it because you'll hear about it later and you'll read about it in this little uh, program. The Keweenaw Bay Indian community, uh, Jan Schultz told me who she was here last year, the botanist from the United States Forest Service. It looks like the Keweenaw Bay Indian community will be the first, will have the first native plants greenhouse on any American Indian reservation in North America. Can you believe that? So, you'll be hearing more about that, but I was just deeply honored. I, I had sent an invitation over to the tribe last week, and I didn't know if, if uh, we were going to have some representatives. And I just found out that we have the president of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community with us tonight. Came over from Baraga. Chris, you're going to hear from him. Um, just bring a greeting, will you, Chris? And if, if you'd like to, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. Uh, the Keweenaw Bay Indian community is uh, is happy to be partnering with the Cedar Tree Institute and the U.S. Forest Service and trying to protect uh, native plants and bring them back home here. Uh, one day we hope the Keweenaw Bay Indian community will re be regarded as pioneers uh, to bring these native plants back home here. So it, it's only fitting, you know, that the Keweenaw Bay Indian community become involved in helping save those native plants. So I just wanted to uh, say, th say thank you to the Cedar Tree Institute and John Magnuson and uh, keep up the good work, guys, because we've been partnering with you for a number of years now with the Cedar Tree Institute with the Wild Rice Manumen Project. And also uh, we've worked with uh, native plants down at the uh, Sand Point, I think it was. So we've been working with the Cedar Tree Institute for a number of years and they're just great to work with. So. Uh, we're happy to contribute uh, to help uh, uh, build a greenhouse here up on the Cuna Bay Chief. So thank you, miigwech to everyone for coming and enjoy your meal and the wonderful music we have here planned tonight. This project, the Zadki project, uh, you'll hear more about it from our youth volunteers, but it's to protect pollinators and they're actually threatening our ecosystem. We happen to be in a migration path here of the monarch butterflies. A lot of people don't know that. And they fly 2,000 miles next month. They're going to start flying in August down into Mexico. They ride the thermal winds 18 inches off the ground, 2,000 feet in the air. That's a, over 2,000 miles they fly. And uh, one of our dreams is to have some of these young people travel and follow them one day into Mexico. So that's a dream. We'll see if that happens. This project's all about native plants and how we need to protect them. And that's why this Indian community that was represented tonight, the Keweenaw Bay, they're going to be the first Indian reservation in North America to have this native plant greenhouse. You can't get these plants at Kmart or Walmart or Meister's. They have to be collected. They're not commercially sold, except by small little groups of people. So tonight, you're all going to be given, given some native plants. Um, certainly, in urban environments, the amount of land that pollinators, which are not optional for us, need is surprisingly small. The conversion of a yard that's just grass to plant species, whether they're natives or non-natives, that produce the nectar and the pollen, is an amazing switch for these things. They don't ask for much, and they need their, their home ranges are very tiny. So simply converting property to gardens, vegetable garden and a native plant garden, or a non-native plant garden with the old-fashioned heirloom species that um, still provide the, the nectar source for them. Two, two things that can be done without us, without it really changing our lifestyle at all. Name a couple of plants you'd like to see people plant. In their gardens. Um, actually, milkweed has gotten a very bad rap and some species are easier to put in cultivation or put in a garden than, other, than, than others, but boy, do insects use them. They're perennials, they're hardy. Um, some, some species are fairly diminutive in a plant setting, so ex 
extremely useful. And then another one that has gotten a bad rap, we have about 12 species of solidago or goldenrod here in um, the Upper Peninsula. If anybody wanted to really learn pollinators, what they look like, plant goldenrod and just stand there. First of all, the plant is beautiful. And secondly, it is extremely useful to just a whole host of pollinators from soldier beetles to all kinds of wasps and bees and butterflies. Amazing. They're perennial. They're really pretty. We take them for granted in this country because we have so many species of goldenrod, but in Europe, they're the rage. Uh, they think more highly of our goldenrods apparently than we do. We tend to think of them as weeds. As we tend to think of them as weeds because some species are fairly uh, robust and will colonize areas you know, pretty readily. Some of them are really diminutive and, and uh, kind of dainty. But in terms of uh, native plants useful to our pollinators, those two species are keystone. You can put them in a garden border in the back. Uh, easy to grow, can be grown from seed, put the seed in the soil in the winter, let them stratify in the soil over the winter, they grow up next year. So when we used to think it's great to have the perfect lawn, you'd rather have people see devote some of it to native plants? Yes, I would. I, I think uh, little things like that collectively end up making a huge difference.